morning, everyone. Happy Christmas. I hope you're well, wherever you're joining us from. It's great to have you with us this morning. And this morning, obviously, we're looking at Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Surprise, surprise. And our two readings, one is a prophecy, and uh, one is the story of uh, Jesus' birth. So we're starting with Isaiah chapter 52, verses 7 to 10. That's Isaiah chapter 52, verses 7 to 10. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our Lord. And from Luke chapter 1, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. Luke 2, 1 to 21. It was about that same time that Augustus Caesar sent out an order to all people in the countries that were under Roman rule. The order said that everyone's name must be put on a list. This was the first counting of all the people while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone travelled to their hometowns to have their name put on the list. So Joseph left Nazareth, a town in Galilee, and went to the town of Bethlehem in Judea. It was known as the town of David. Joseph went there because he was from the family of David, and he registered with Mary because she was engaged to marry him. She was now pregnant. While Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have the baby. She gave birth to her first son. She wrapped him up well and laid him in a box where the cattle are fed. She put him there because the guest room was full. That night, some shepherds were out in the fields near Bethlehem, watching their sheep. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord was shining around them. The shepherds were very afraid. The angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I have some very good news for you, news that will make everyone happy. Today, your Saviour was born in David's town. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This is how you will know him. You will find a baby wrapped in pieces of cloth, and lying in a feeding box. Then a huge army of angels from heaven joined the first angel, and they were all praising God, saying, Praise God in heaven and on earth. Let there be peace to the people who please him. The angels left the shepherds and went back to heaven. The shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this great event the Lord has told us about. So they went running and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the feeding box. When they saw the baby, they told what the angels said about this child. Everyone was surprised when they heard what the shepherds told them. Mary continued to think about these things, trying to understand them. The shepherds went back to their sheep, praising God and thanking him for everything they'd seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. When the baby was eight days old, he was circumcised and he was named Jesus. This name was given by the angel before the baby began to grow inside Mary. So what do you imagine when you think about God? He's hard to describe, isn't he? But we might all agree that we can start, for example, by mentioning the fact that he's all-knowing. He's all-powerful and he's present everywhere. And we need that, don't we? We need God to be in control. We need his truth and light to be in the ascendancy, ultimately unchallengeable. It's reassuring for us as people of faith, and it's vital for our well-being that God never sleeps and is in full control. But then we come to that night in Bethlehem when Jesus gave up all of those qualities to become one of us. St. Paul puts it this way, Jesus emptied himself on our behalf. And it's breathtaking, isn't it? Just think how vulnerable he was. A helpless infant needing his nappy changing, 
having to learn to crawl before learning to walk, then learning Aramaic and how to speak. Gerald Manley Hopkins puts it, we believe in omnipotence, surrendering to incontinence. The name above every name, rumoured to be illegitimate. We believe that God's eternal word once squeals like a baby. And when eventually he learned to speak, it was with a regional accent. The creator of the cosmos made tables and presumably he made them badly at first. What else would we notice about this upside down gift of God on Christmas Day? Because on that night in Bethlehem, God showed us that we needed not only God all powerful, all seeing, all knowing, but God with us, Jesus, stripped of all his advantages, stepping out of eternity into time so that we in turn are no longer trapped in time ourselves. He allowed himself to be subject to the worst of humanity instead of us, so that we can enjoy eternal life, beginning now. God lived in one place at one time, so that he could set everyone free for all time. The Christmas story shows the lengths God will go to, the risks he will take on our behalf. But that's only the beginning. The Jesus story continues through Jesus' resurrection at Easter and through to today, Jesus God with us. We like to think we would give up anything, maybe everything for the people we love. Well, Jesus gave up everything for us because however strange it may sound, it turns out we are everything to God. You think it could have been different that Jesus could have just walked in from the desert, 28 years old and ready to lead, without the need for vulnerability, without the need for infancy, a childhood or teenage years even. But maybe Jesus had to experience everything we do so, for example, by being born to Mary and Joseph like that, it ensured that Jesus did not have to live without a family and a community. He wasn't just wrapped in swaddling clothes when he was born, he was wrapped in love. Maybe God understood how Jesus would need a community to love him, to raise him and prepare him for his mission in life. After all, he was used to it. He came from a heavenly community of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Maybe it was just as important that Jesus had an earthly community. In February, we're planning a series called The Divine Dance, which is looking at how important our relationship with God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit is. And we'll be exploring this together, this community together. In God's economy, it seems you can live without wealth, you can live without power, you can be born in poverty or disadvantage. But the one thing that we're never supposed to be without is community. God ensured that Jesus had a family and a community to nurture him, to protect him and to invest in his life. We saw signs of this, didn't we, when Jesus was taken to the temple after his birth and Simeon and Anna were waiting to welcome him and speak into his life. I know about this, I've experienced it. 45 years ago, I decided to follow Jesus because I came to the overwhelming realization that I was empty inside and that what was broken in my soul, only Jesus could heal. I had no doubt at that moment how badly I needed God and I gave my life to Jesus. But Jesus was not the whole story. The community God gave me was astonishing. It's called the church, and it exists everywhere I've lived. Even when we connect with God, it doesn't eliminate our need for people. If anything, it deepens our need for people. Jesus died to connect us to himself, but he also died to connect us to each other. And something gets lost when we try to live our lives with God alone. 
So much of what God intends to do in our lives can only be done when we are in community with each other. It's how God develops our character. It's how God builds our future. How he encourages us and gives us people to be with. God doesn't do faithfulness in isolation. He does it by connecting us to others and allowing their lives to press against our lives, making us the person God created us to be. God gives us the gift of life, but the wrapping and packaging of that gift is called the church. So at Christmas, you have the opportunity to make two defining decisions for your life. One is to trust Jesus with all of yourself, every aspect of your life, every inch of your soul, to begin a life of faithfulness and say, Jesus, I belong to you. The second is to take a full part in your church community. St Mary's, for example, is not something we attend, not something we consume. The church is something we become when we begin to live, live our life together. This Christmas, we all know the world is a mess. Humanity is in trouble. But this is not the humanity we have to accept. This is not the future we have to embrace. This is why Jesus came, because with him there is a new way. Pete Gregg says, when I think of the deep prejudices in my world towards those on the margins, I pray that God would reveal even the slightest attitude of superiority in my heart. He asked God to show him how he can love and serve someone who might otherwise be ignored or despised this Christmas. So let's grasp this offer, this promise of God, this promise of peace on earth, the promise of goodwill to all humankind through Jesus. And join in with the church to pray and work for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Can I invite you to pray with me? Let's pray first for Jesus' invitation to you and me personally. You might want to posture yourself to give and receive from God as you pray this. Jesus, I bring you my life. I know I'm not what I should be in you. I admit my shortcomings, my part in the wreckage of this world. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, for rising from the dead. Today I choose you, I will follow you, no turning back. I receive your forgiveness, I receive your love, I receive your life. I surrender to you, in Jesus' name. And secondly, you might like to pray for our place in the church. Father, thank you for our local church. May we move away from being attenders and spectators. May we become part of your family, part of your church. Father, we refuse to walk alone. We commit to life together. Please fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit to do this, we pray. So thank you everybody. We're open again on the 8th of January and again you don't have to arrive alone. You can invite someone to bring with you to experience the St Mary's and Christchurch communities. It'll be our normal service pattern, 8.15, 9.45 and 11.15. You don't have to agree with us to be with us. You are welcome whoever you are. So do come back. Happy Christmas.